Uh, hello, everyone. So the, the, the contest is over, and now we'll have uh, uh, three lecture days, and in a couple of days, we'll know the winners. And uh, now it's time to, to relax and uh, to listen for some uh, interesting lectures, uh, which we have prepared. And uh, it's honor for me to, to open this uh, lecture days uh, with a lecture on uh, surprise properties of uh, loss landscapes in uh, modern deep neural networks. Okay, so uh, that's that. Uh, so we'll start with a, a small preamble, uh, which I personally find uh, quite important now. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, deep learning is now uh, able to achieve state of the art and many uh, practical applications and many practical problems. Uh, but the, the interesting fact is that uh, we understand less and less of what's happening in the modern and the huge dimensional uh, weight spaces when we train uh, deep neural networks. And uh, from some point, um, more than deep learning is more like uh, natural sciences, uh, sciences of uh, 18th and 19th century rather than a branch of uh, applied mathematics now. And uh, surprisingly, it appears that uh, currently researchers need more uh, the knowledge of experiment design, the knowledge of scientific method rather than a mathematical background, because we observe many surprising and even mystical uh, effects in the, in the process of training of modern uh, deep neural networks. And uh, there is a risk that um, deep learning may become a uh, second quantum mechanics with its uh, inglorious uh, thesis, uh, shut up and calculate. Uh, because uh, there's a growing um, oh, opinion in some part of community that uh, if deep uh, networks are, are working, then everything's fine. And just we, we should not just care about uh, trying to understanding what's really happening uh, in the deep neural networks. I think that uh, this is a uh, very well uh, wrong issue and uh, that uh, we need to, to spend some time and uh, try to understand what's happening and uh, this is uh, um, the, the main motivation of my today's talk uh, so we'll start with uh, some open uh, questions and more than deep learning so the first of them is uh, the huge gap between uh, theory and practice between uh, statistical theory which uh, describes and uh, uh, estimates the generalization gap and uh, uh, the, the 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 effects we observe in in, in real uh, deep neural networks for example our statistical theory predicts that uh, we should have a huge gap uh, especially in over parameterized in uh, huge dimensional deep networks but uh, all well engineers or uh, data engineers know that uh, the larger uh, the wider and the deeper network we have uh, the better is its uh, generalization ability so there's a contradiction between theory and practice also, we know that uh, more than deep neural networks are easy, uh, can easily fit uh, randomly labeled data. So uh, uh, they're vulnerable to uh, catastrophic overfitting. But uh, nevertheless, uh, in practice, uh, deep networks work. And we know that in practice, they have a good generalization. Also, uh, there were recently uh, discovered so-called minefields effect in the uh, terrain loss landscape. And I will, I will uh, discuss it in a few slides later. Uh, we know that uh, global minima are interconnected and um, probably form a kind of a uh, well, I'm going to be high dimensional uh, manifold. And this is also interesting and it's not clear uh, why it happens. Uh, we know that uh, we have a strange effect called double descent, uh, which we'll also discuss during my talk. And it still lacks uh, an explanation. And finally, it's interesting uh, whether we could predict uh, how our infinitely uh, wide deep neural network will work and uh, how infinitely large deep ensembles will work. And uh, this is uh, the last topic. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that we'll have time to cover it, but uh, anyway, if, if, if we have, uh, then we'll discuss it uh, as well. So uh, the outline of my uh, today's talk. Uh, first, we'll start with a um, discussion of uh, how learning rate influences the width of uh, uh, train loss minima and uh, the, the generalization ability. Uh, then we'll uh, try to understand how it's related with the um, Mode connectivity effect with a, a fractal hypothesis that the, the, the train loss uh, might, might have a fractal structure. Uh, we'll discuss a double descent and its a possible explanation based on the observations that we will make to this point. And uh, um, finally, I will present one of the uh, hypotheses of mine uh, about the, 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 the possible new theory of generalization for uh, deep learning, which is different from the st uh, classical statistical learning theory. OK, so we'll start uh, with a such experiment. Consider um, 
neural network of fixed structure. And uh, let us uh, try to train it in two different regimes. And the first regime will start uh, from small learning rate, while the second regime will start from large learning rate. And then after, after a while, we'll perform a uh, annealing of learning rate. So uh, these are the plots of uh, training and validation accuracy. And uh, what we see here, in both cases, uh, we're able to achieve 100% uh, of training accuracy. So everything seems to be fine. But at the same time, if we, com if we uh, consider validation accuracy, uh, we'll see that uh, the, it, it is different. So if we start with a small learning rate, we will end up somewhere here. While if we start from large learning rate and then perform annealing, uh, we'll, uh, we do uh, significantly better. So from training uh, error, everything is, is uh, uh, similar. So in both cases, we achieve 100% uh, of accuracy. But uh, surprisingly, we have a different generalization. So it's, it's not good uh, to start from small learning rates. So it's better to start from large learning rate and then perform annealing. So why is it, is it the case? So this is an open question. Uh, another interesting observation is uh, so-called minefields, uh, which were recently discovered in the terrain loss uh, landscape. Uh, so let us uh, train some neural network and let us visualize its uh, trajectory from initialization point to final point. I want this trajectory. So here uh, we use the TSNE uh, visualization method. Uh, we can see that uh, the train error becomes smaller and smaller. Uh, and uh, at the final point, we also have a quite small test error. But surprisingly, if we fix any point along our trajectory, and if we uh, try to find uh, the point of low train error and uh, high validation error in the neighborhood of any point, uh, surprisingly, we'll easily uh, we'll be able to, to, to find it. So along the, the whole path, there exist multiple points, uh, which are depicted here as a, a blue points, where train error is zero, while uh, validation or test error is uh, arbitrarily high. And uh, these points were well, called mines, and uh, uh, the, the, the process of, of optimization is like going through the minefield. So uh, any of these blue points is good from uh, our initial objective, from uh, uh, the test loss point of view. Uh, in all of them, test loss is zero, but uh, the digitalization is arbitrarily poor. And somehow our optimization method just doesn't see the, those points. And it's able to traverse uh, along these points and to end up in a good point, in a point where we have both a zero train error and a very small uh, test error. Why this happens? Again, uh, this is still uh, not clear. And one possible explanation uh, could be the following. And uh, it, it, it's related with the width of uh, our global minimum. So there's a um, common, although uh, unproven belief in community that wide minima uh, have better generalization than uh, narrow minima. And this is uh, well, schematically depicted here. Uh, so if we have uh, our train loss, which is a uh, uh, web port here, and uh, the test loss, which is a uh, dashed, uh, red dashed line. So if we end up in a flat minima or in a wide minima, uh, then probably we'll have a good uh, train accuracy and good uh, test accuracy. While in the sharp minima, the, the train error is zero and the test error can be arbitrarily high. This is still a hypothesis. So uh, there's no theoretical guarantees, uh, but uh, empirically we observe that uh, it is more or less correct. And then uh, how we can explain the, the, the effects from the previous slides. Uh, maybe we somehow end up in the uh, flat minima rather than in the sharp minima, although there are many, many sharp minima uh, which are present in, uh, in our uh, terrain loss uh, landscape. And uh, probably uh, the, the, the result that we end in the uh, flat minima uh, can be explained uh, by the properties of our stochastic optimization tool. Uh, so our stochastic gradient and uh, its uh, uh, numerous modifications uh, have some inductive bias that uh, encourage the convergence to the flat minima rather than to the sharp minima. And uh, one informal explanation of this uh, can, be, can be the following. So imagine uh, some short-sighted person uh, who took off his glasses. So he can still see the environment, but not in details. So instead of uh, this sharp picture, we, we see some smooth picture. And uh, uh, in the context, uh, context of optimization, this means that um, we simply do not uh, see the tiny details of our uh, objective function. And those tiny details are exactly those uh, sharp minima. 
Uh, why why uh, we can't see the details? Because uh, our gradient has some variance. So we're, we're using stochastic optimization tools and uh, we're using stochastic gradients. And stochastic gradient is, uh, uh, has some variance. And the larger variance we have, uh, the less details uh, can, be seen, can be observed by our optimizer. Uh, how I can control the variance of a stochastic gradient? Well, uh, one way is to uh, change the, the, the size of the image. Another way is to change the learning rate. So let us uh, stop on the second setting. So let us fix uh, the size of the mini batch and let us change the, the learning rate. So the, the small learning rate we have, the smaller is the variance of, of our stochastic gradient and uh, the more details we can see in our uh, objective uh, function, uh, in the, in, on the landscape of our objective function. And then uh, we can formulate the following hypothesis, which I called a fractal hypothesis, that the uh, loss landscape has a kind of fractal structure. Uh, and uh, there are many uh, global minima of, of, of different width. So we have a sharp minima, we have wide minima, we have some medium sized minima. And uh, uh, the, the, the loss itself uh, probably looks uh, like a, a kind of fractal, at least at, at, a, at the variety of scales. Uh, and if this hypothesis is right, so I uh, well, try to depict it here schematically. Uh, this is my own drawing. So it's, it's uh, of course far from perfect. But anyway, I think that it reflects the, the, the main aspects which I would like to discuss here. So assume that we have a, a such kind of a loss landscape. So there are many, many uh, sharp minima and there are also wide minima as well. Uh, then uh, what will happen if we start from say uh, this blue star. So this is our initialization point. Uh, if we start uh, our training with a small learning rate from the very beginning. Then we can see many details of our, our objective function. And then we, of course, uh, are converging to the, close, to the closest uh, global minimum. And uh, most likely it is a sharp minimum. So we end up here. Uh, we have zero train loss, but since the minimum is sharp, the minimum is sharp, uh, the generalization can be quite poor. Or, or at least it can be worse than the, the generalization, uh, which we would have uh, if we converge to the wide minimum. To the same, uh, at the same time, if we start from the same point, but using a larger learning rate, then we can see the, the details and uh, we treat this uh, white, uh, this uh, black function as uh, this uh, green function. So we can see just some uh, very general uh, uh, properties of our uh, objective function, but not with details. So we treat uh, the black function as a green function and we converge somewhere here. So the train loss is still not zero. And if here uh, we perform annealing and the switch to smaller uh, learning trait, then we uh, end up in some sharp minima, uh, minimum which lies inside of wide minimum. And this is why uh, the generalization is better. And so this explains uh, the first experiment. Uh, uh, we show that uh, if, if, if we use a large learning trait in the beginning and then perform annealing, then uh, we'll obtain better generalization. But also it explains the, the effect of minefields. So we can see all those uh, multiple sharp minima are kind, uh, kind of uh, mine, uh, are kind of mines, uh, because uh, uh, in all of them we have a uh, zero train loss and uh, can have a uh, arbitrarily large uh, test loss. Also, when I say that it's fractal, I mean that uh, if we zoom, uh, say, uh, this this uh, sharp minima, we'll see that it itself consists of a uh, multiple even sharper minima. This is why uh, the, the, the loss um, behaves like a fractal. So this is still a hypothesis, but, but this hypothesis uh, uh, is able to explain several ob uh, observations that we have. And now let us try to um, build uh, some experiments, uh, which at, at least uh, partly uh, will, uh, will allow to confirm or to disprove the, the fractal hypothesis. So this is it. Uh, we take a single deep neural network. Uh, we take the same initialization and we start uh, training uh, with the constant learning rates and uh, the, the, the learning rates are different. So uh, they, they are equal to uh, one over scale squared and different scales are shown here. So uh, the larger is scale, the smaller is our learning rate. Uh, and here uh, we plot the uh, specter of a fish information matrix. So fish information matrix is a, um, some proxy to uh, PCM of our train loss uh, objective. So uh, you can see that uh, 
the smaller learning rates we have, uh, the larger is our spectrum. So uh, this means that uh, we have a larger curvature uh, of the loss landscape. And uh, well, not surprisingly, we have a, uh, the, the, this picture. So uh, uh, if we have a large learning rates, we have a small curvature. So this is a, a blue histogram. And if we uh, start increasing our learning rate and uh, recall that uh, learning rate is constant during the whole uh, training process, uh, then uh, our curvature becomes larger and larger. But still, it's not clear whether we have a scale invariance. And we know that uh, if our loss landscape uh, has a, a fractal uh, structure, then uh, we should observe scale invariance. And scale invariance is depicted here schematically. So we take fractal and uh, if we well zoom in some some uh, fragment of the fractal, then it's uh, the fragment uh, looks exactly as the, the, the initial picture. So this is scale invariance. Uh, so the only difference in the in the scale, and if we change the scale, then uh, everything uh, starts looking just as uh, uh, the initial picture was. So uh, how we can uh, check whether uh, scale invariance holds true here? Well, it's not uh, actually that difficult. Uh, we know that fission formation matrix is positive uh, definite. And let us change the scale of the x-axis. Let us switch to uh, log, uh, log scale. And then surprisingly, we observe the following picture. So these are our four histograms from the previous slide, uh, but in the uh, log x scale. So what we see here, we see that the, actually the histograms are almost uh, the same and only different and they only uh, differ by a constant uh, shift. And shift in the log scale corresponds to the uh, multiplying by constant in the initial scale. So this means that uh, if we uh, consider say uh, this uh, sharp minimum with a, a large curvature. And if we zoom in, then uh, this large, uh, this, this sharp minima will turn to a, a wide minima, uh, to the minima uh, with exactly the same spectra as say uh, this blue curve. Okay, so that's uh, what we can do. So we, can, we may uh, simply match uh, all four histograms and we see that uh, they actually describe, uh, well, the same coverage. So this is uh, indirect proof that uh, probably we, we really have a, a kind of a scale invariance, at least at, at some range of scales. And this uh, uh, indirectly, well, if not prove, maybe I, I shouldn't say that it proves, but at least uh, this is an argument in favor of this uh, fractal hypothesis that we really have a multiple minima of different uh, scale and uh, we have a kind of scale invariance. So this is why it's quite important to uh, monitor our learning rate. And we should uh, always, always keep in mind that uh, different learning rates correspond to different uh, resolution ability. And uh, to, uh, this is the ability uh, of our optimizer to see uh, sharp minima. And uh, we should also keep in mind that uh, the most of our global minima are actually sharp minima. Okay, uh, so at this point, uh, some of you may, may think that uh, maybe this is too exotic hypothesis and maybe the, the true loss landscape uh, is not so complicated. And the answer is, uh, well, not so. So this is uh, the picture of a train loss landscape from a real problem. And uh, we have taken a two dimensional slice. So of course, uh, uh, we, should, we should remember that uh, we are trying to solve optimization problems in the huge dimensional spaces and the spaces of uh, uh, million uh, that have a million dimensions, or even tens of millions of dimensions. And uh, it's, it's uh, very difficult uh, to characterize them somehow uh, because we simply can't work in, in such uh, huge dimensional spaces. Uh, but even if we take a random two dimensional slice, we can see that uh, actually the loss landscape is, uh, well, not so, not so smooth and uh, not so trivial. And now let us perform the following experiment. Uh, which uh, will make the situation even more surprising. Uh, let us train uh, neural network uh, from two different uh, initializations. So we'll end up in uh, two different uh, points of global minimum, uh, points with a zero train loss. And now let us try to find the path which connects uh, those two uh, global minimums. Uh, and uh, the, the question is whether such path, path exists or not. And uh, if so, if, if it does, then uh, is, it, is it really complicated or maybe it, it has a, a simple structure? 
soon here I will uh, show you a small video. Hopefully. Yes. So this is one minute uh, video of the effect which we have discovered, uh, which shows that uh, all global minima are interconnected. So the experiment is, is following. We have uh, two points of global minima, which we obtained uh, from two different initializations. And now we're trying to build a one dimensional Bezier curve, uh, which, try, which uh, connects those minimums. And we try to um, minimize the train error along the whole curve, which, which connects those two minimums. So let's see what happens. Optima in position. Beginning training process. Using Bezier curve. Searching for pathway. successfully connected confirmed optima of deep networks are connected by simple pathways with near constant accuracy so this is it and now let's uh, get back uh, to my slides aha uh -huh. one moment So I should stop it. So can you see? Hey. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so uh, what we've seen, uh, what we have just seen, uh, it appeared that, uh, and uh, this, this is effect which was uh, reproduced many times with uh, uh, different data sets with different uh, neural architectures, that in all cases, we were able to build a path which uh, connects two different uh, global minima of the train loss. It means that, uh, Actually, all, uh, all global minimums, all points of global minimum uh, form a uh, um, single manifold of unknown dimensionality. Probably the dimensionality is uh, pretty large uh, because uh, we were able to, to, to find the path uh, which connects those minima uh, using very, very simple uh, curve, either Bezier curve or even uh, this uh, two segment uh, line. So, uh, and uh, it's interesting. Uh, and then we may hypothesize of what is happening when uh, our deep neural network achieved uh, zero train uh, error or zero train loss. So after that, if we keep, uh, if we keep training, uh, then probably uh, it will exhibit a kind of random work behavior in the manifold of uh, zero train loss. Because we know that uh, if we continue training, uh, our train loss key, uh, is, is, is constant, is almost zero. Uh, but something is happening because our test loss uh, is changing. If we keep training after achieving uh, zero train loss. And it's interesting, uh, well, to, to understand what's happening during this uh, second stage, during this uh, uh, random walking in the manifold of zero uh, train loss. And uh, this understanding could probably uh, provide a better explanation of a double descent phenomenon. So we're now switching to double descent, and then we'll try to, to form uh, the whole picture. So, what is double descent? Uh, According uh, to classical point of view, uh, what will happen if we uh, fix uh, our training data and uh, start increasing uh, the uh, complexity of our training algorithm? So classical theory states that uh, the behavior will be uh, as follows. So if we increase the complexity of our model, uh, our train error becomes less and less, while our test error uh, first 
decreases and uh, after some point it starts increasing and this increase corresponds to overfitting. So this is what uh, uh, classical statistical learning theory tells us. But what we observe in practice, if we start using uh, deep neural networks. So we know that uh, deep neural networks are highly overparameterized, so they have uh, uh, many orders more parameters that it's needed to, to, to explain the training data. And then the behavior is falling. So at first, uh, you know, network behave just uh, like it should do according to the uh, classical predictions. So the, the uh, train error gets uh, smaller and smaller. A test error first decreases, then starts to increase. But after some point, however, uh, the test error starts decreasing again. And uh, this transition, uh, which is sometimes called the interpolation threshold, uh, approximately corresponds to the switch from, uh, from anti-parameterized setting to over-parameterized setting. Uh, but still, uh, it, it, it's not clear why, why, why that happens, why we have this uh, double decent behavior. Uh, so even more recent results, uh, which was published uh, on this year, iClear, states that uh, the same happens um, uh, if, if we start changing not the, the, the complexity of our model, but uh, if we start changing the number of epochs uh, we use for, for, for training. But first, uh, let, let, let us uh, discuss even more surprising effect. So uh, if, if uh, we have this double decent behavior uh, by uh, when, when we change the complexity of our model, uh, we can consider the dual formulation. Let us fix our, the complexity of the model and let us change the size of our training data. Then what will happen? When our training data is small and the, the, the model is uh, relatively co uh, complicated, then we are in the over-parameterized regime. Uh, but if we start increasing our training data, our over-parameterization over becomes less and less. Uh, and we, we, we go in, in the opposite direction here. So we, we switch from over-parameterized regime to under-parameterized regime, because uh, if our training data is huge and uh, uh, our model is fixed, then after some point, uh, the model becomes too simple to explain the, the training data. So this means that uh, in this switch, uh, we should observe the increase of the test error. And this is really what we're observing. And uh, this is the, the left plot here. So this is a kind of a paradoxical effect that uh, in some cases, more training data hurts. So if we increase uh, the number of training data, uh, then there are such settings uh, where the arrival of uh, more training data uh, decreases the performance, decreases the uh, accuracy on the test set. Of course, uh, if, we, if we keep increasing uh, training data even more, then uh, the, the behavior will change. But even uh, the presence of such parts uh, is, is, is surprising. So that uh, sometimes the arrival of more training data may uh, worsen the, the situation. Uh, another observation is uh, the discovery of uh, epoch-wise double distance. So it appears that uh, many models uh, else exhibit double distance behavior uh, during uh, their training. So if we take a model, uh, if we start training it, uh, then our test error first decreases, then uh, after a while starts to increase and then starts decreasing again. And actually it appears that uh, the, the general picture is something like this. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, Port where we have uh, on x-axis uh, the, the complexity of our model, on y-axis the number of epochs we trained, and uh, the car uh, indicates the, the test error. So if we, for example, uh, fix the number of epochs and starts, uh, uh, changing, start changing the, the complexity of the model, then first uh, our test error decreases, then it increases, and then it starts decreasing again. So double decent behavior, which is called model-wise double decent. On the other hand, uh, we may uh, fix the complexity of our model, say uh, this, uh, and if we uh, monitor how it behaves uh, with respect to epochs, we again, first uh, our test error becomes less, then it becomes larger, and then uh, exhibits uh, second decent. So we also have a double decent with respect to the epochs. So that's interesting, and uh, it's still uh, unclear why that happens. And one possible hypothesis, uh, which was, uh, well, um, instead, uh, formulated this year by several independent research groups, including ours, is following that. Um, uh, so let, let, let us consider the epochwise double descent. So uh, this means that uh, we fix the complexity of the model and just 
monitor how it behaves uh, with uh, changing the number of epochs. Uh, the hypothesis is that our training process is two stage. So at, the at first stage, uh, GPT network tries to uh, memorize our training data by whatever means uh, possible. And at the second stage, uh, we uh, and uh, during the, this stage we converge to the uh, sharp minimum. And at the second stage, uh, we perform a random walk uh, and slowly drift from sharp minimum to uh, wide minimum. And at this stage, we, we exhibit the, the second descent and our uh, test error uh, decreases again. Okay, this is, uh, up to now, this is still some informal hypothesis and it's not clear how to check it. Uh, moreover, uh, in, the, in, in the first part of my talk, I uh, repeated several times that uh, uh, if, we, if we use stochastic optimization tools uh, with a fixed learning rate, then uh, we can't see narrow minima. Or can we? And the, the answer is actually not so simple. Uh, let us consider a two-dimensional case. And let us remember that uh, modern deep neural networks are usually trained with a batch normalization. And batch normalization, well, uh, first it is a very um, well, complicated procedure and it's uh, not clear uh, so uh, everybody understands that uh, this is extremely useful procedure. It uh, dramatically simplifies the process of training, uh, but there's uh, still no uh, understanding of, of uh, why it works. Uh, probably the, the, the reason for that is uh, because uh, it combines several different things in one procedure. And uh, uh, one of those things is uh, radial invariance. So this means that uh, it would take the weights of our deep neural network and if we multiply all the weights by a positive constant, uh, then we'll end up with a neural network which uh, implements exactly the same function. So uh, the, the two neural networks are functionally equivalent. Uh, this means that along all uh, radii here, uh, actually uh, any point on this radii corresponds to exactly the uh, same uh, deep neural network. But what is changing if we start uh, multiplying our weights by constant? And the answer is, well, the width is changing. The width of our minimum is changing. So uh, consider this uh, unit sphere and consider two points, red and green. Uh, both points correspond to uh, zero train error. So these are global minima of our objective function. But uh, red star correspond to sharp minimum while, uh, while uh, green star correspond to wide minimum. And now let us uh, scale both points say by a factor of 10. Uh, then we end up to a different sphere. And uh, on this sphere, our sharp minima became larger. And uh, if we use the classic optimization tool, which cannot see, say, uh, the minimum of uh, this high curvature, uh, then by increasing the uh, norm of our weight, weights, uh, we're able to, to achieve such point where uh, this, minimum, uh, this minimum becomes visible. And our stochastic optimization method is able to find it. So then uh, our two-stage hypothesis can be formulated as following, as follows. Ah, yeah. And, uh, um, uh, so uh, this, the, uh, the, the effect of uh, um, decreasing the curvature of our uh, global minima uh, makes it reasonable to, to establish additional notion of reduced width. So this is uh, what width uh, the corresponding minima would have if we projected it to the unit sphere. And probably we, uh, we need to compare uh, the reduced width of different minimums rather than uh, the, 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 the <coughs> initial width because uh, uh, the, the, the width can be made arbitrary large just by increasing the norm of our weight space. Okay, so now uh, how can uh, the two-stage hypothesis can be reformulated in these geometric terms? So the first stage, uh, we started from some initialization point. Uh, we uh, used stochastic optimization tool and uh, our weight norm starts increasing uh, and we end somewhere here. So this is the first, uh, point where we achieve zero train error. Uh, and the, the weight norm is uh, relatively large. Uh, and this is the point where uh, the test error peaks. So uh, wh wh why it peaks? Because uh, we achieved uh, zero train error, but actually the reduced width of this minimum is, is pretty small. So actually this is a sharp minimum and generalization is quite poor. But uh, our, our neural network just doesn't know about that because uh, uh, it doesn't have, have access to the uh, validation set. And from training point of view, everything is fine. So we have zero train error. And then second st uh, stage uh, starts. And in this second stage, 
uh, we drift from uh, this minimum of uh, from sharp minimum to wide minimum. And if we use weight decay, we can also observe it uh, because our weight uh, weight norm uh, will decrease. And uh, finally, at the at the end of the second stage, we end up approximately here. And uh, this is a, a green star, so this is a point with a uh, where, where the reduced width is a pretty large. So this is a wide minimum, and uh, this is why uh, the the generalization here is is good. So probably uh, uh, each time when uh, we observe double decent behavior, we have these two stages of learning. So first, we try uh, to do uh, all we can to just memorize our training data. And this memorization uh, leads to a sharp minimum. And at the second stage, we try to perform a kind of memory consolidation. So we try to um, well, simplify the irregularities we have discovered for explaining the training data. And during this simplification, uh, we, we drift from a sharp minimum to a wide minimum. So again, uh, this is still hypothesis, but this is a, a geometric explanation of the hypothesis. And now let us check whether uh, it can be observed empirically. So the first experiment, we use uh, three neural networks, uh, small, medium size, and large. So in all cases, uh, we have a monotonic decrease of train error. Uh, and uh, our small neural network is, is not able to achieve uh, zero turn error because it's too simple, uh, while two other neural networks are able to achieve uh, zero uh, turn error, zero loss. So what's happening with the test loss? Uh, so those neural networks that were able to achieve uh, zero turn loss exhibit double decent behavior. So first our test, test loss uh, decreases, then it starts to increase, and then it starts decreasing again. And now let's see what's happening with the uh, uh, note uh, that uh, the our simple model doesn't exhibit double decent behavior because it's too simple, so we were not able to uh, even to memorize the training data. And now let's see what's happen what happens with the weight norm. So first, uh, the weight norm uh, increases in all three cases, and for simple model, uh, the uh, the weight norm uh, keeps increasing or uh, stabilizes at some point, while two other two more complicated models. Uh, uh, show different behavior. So first our weight norm uh, increases and then it starts to decrease. And this is exactly the second stage of our learning. So uh, during this increase, uh, during this decrease of the weight norm, we drift from a uh, sharp minimum to wide minimum. And when I tell uh, sharp and wide, of course, I mean reduced uh, width. So this is the width, which we would have if we had uh, uh, our weights on the uh, unit sphere. So this is a uh, first experiment. And now second experiment. Actually, why should we, why should we drift from a uh, sharp minimum to, to, to wide minimum? Uh, what's different uh, in the sharp and wide minimum? So uh, again, since uh, here uh, we have already achieved zero train loss. So actually uh, we are moving somewhere within the manifold of zero train loss. And we know from our previous experiments that all minima uh, are interconnected. So they, they form a kind of manifold. Uh, and we can well uh, move somewhere uh, within this manifold. But uh, since the manifold, uh, since all points on, the, on this manifold has uh, have uh, zero train loss, this means that uh, the true gradient of our train loss is zero or almost zero there. And the only thing that is uh, different is the variance of uh, our zero mean stochastic gradient. So the, the larger is our curvature, the sharper is our minima, minimum, uh, the larger is the variance of our stochastic gradient. We know that uh, its mean is zero, but the variance is different. And uh, now let us observe what happens uh, if we have uh, this uh, random walk behavior with a different variance at different points. So this is a uh, two experiment. Uh, so assume that our space uh, is uh, one dimensional from minus one to plus one. Uh, and we, we uh, try to perform random walking here. Uh, so we, we, we make random uh, steps uh, with zero mean, and the variance is uh, given by this uh, f function. So it's uh, uh, from uh, 0.5 to uh, 1.5. So it, it differs uh, three times in di at different points of our x space. Uh, and, now, uh, and now let's see uh, where we'll converge. So if we start from uh, random initialization, so uh, from random distribution, x0, which is here, and uh, let's say uh, let's take say one thousand of moves, uh, random um, random steps, uh, where the, the the variance of the step is is given by the function f. 
And surprisingly, we end up not at the, at the, the uniform distribution. So uh, if we had a, uh, equal variance at all points, then of course, uh, it's easy to prove that the uh, stationary distribution or the limit distribution would be uniform distribution from minus one to plus one. But if the variance is different, then the uh, stationary distribution is given by this uh, function. So it's uh, proportional to one over F squared. So this means that uh, the points where the variance was high, are uh, the, the, the least possible, uh, the least probable points. And uh, the modes of our distribution correspond to the points where the variance was small. And the variance is small at the points of wide minimum. So this experiment, again, uh, indirectly proves uh, that uh, after we have uh, reached uh, zero turn error, and we, uh, we start this random walk behavior, uh, since the, the, the variance of our stochastic gradients is different at different points, uh, then our limit distribution will not be uniform and will encourage the convergence to, to wide minima. And this is probably what is happening at the second stage during the consolidation uh, stage in our training process. Okay, now let us switch to another uh, topic I would like to discuss. Uh, this is the gap between uh, um, theory and practice. So uh, statistical learning theory, uh, which is the theory uh, of generalization, uh, provides us upper bound uh, for the gap between uh, train and test loss. And we know that uh, the more complicated model we're using, the larger is the gap between training and uh, test loss, or training and test errors. Uh, but in practice, we, we, we do not observe that. Uh, we know that uh, more complicated models uh, somehow gener generalize better. So the question is, uh, what is the reason? What is the reason of uh, this contradiction between theory and practice? And the possible answer could be the following. Uh, statistical learning theory um, is based on the assumption that uh, we're always able to find global minimum of the train loss. Uh, but when our model is quite complicated, is it really what we're doing when we train our deep neural network? And the answer is, um, well, not exactly. In order to understand that, let us uh, recall uh, Langevin dynamics. Uh, so assume that uh, we're given some distribution P of X in the high dimensional space, and assume that we would like to, to build a sampler from this distribution. So some procedure that is able to generate samples from distribution P of X. So there are different uh, methods for solving this problem. And one of the methods is to use Langevin dynamics. Uh, this is uh, to solve the stochastic differential equation. Uh, and if we discretize it, then actually, uh, what do we do? Uh, we move in our X space and we make steps towards the gradients of log of P of X plus some normal noise. So these are uh, uh, gradient updates plus uh, uh, Gaussian, Gaussian noise. So if we do not have uh, those, this noise, we, we would, of course, uh, uh, converge to the uh, local global maximum of the P of X, so to, to some mode of P of X. But if we add a, uh, additive uh, Gaussian noise, then uh, instead of finding the mode of our distribution, uh, we generate samples from this distribution. And uh, now let us uh, consider what we are doing when we train our deep neural network. Actually, we do pretty much the same. So we evolve in our weight space, we make uh, weight updates, and we update the weights according to the following rule. So uh, we, we, actually, we, we, we make ste steps towards stochastic gradient. And stochastic gradient can be decomposed as follows, as follows, as the true gradient of our tra uh, train loss plus some normal noise. The noise is normal according to central limit theory. Of course, the, 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 exact, uh, the exact parameters of this uh, random noise are not known for us. Uh, this is why we can't say uh, what is the, the corresponding distribution. But what we can say is that uh, instead of optimizing our uh, train loss, we actually sample from some distribution, some distribution that is uh, induced uh, by uh, our training uh, logical function. And that's interesting because instead of uh, solving the optimization problems, we actually sample from distribution. Of course, uh, in practice, uh, we usually observe that we, we are uh, reaching zero train error or almost zero train error. But our points, which we, are, which we obtained during our optimization procedure, are samples from some distribution rather than global modes of this distribution. And it appears that in many cases, especially in high dimensional spaces, 
the modes and the typical samples from distribution may behave uh, in a completely different way. So this is uh, some illustration. So assume that uh, this is uh, the likelihood of our training data. Uh, of course, I, I, I depicted here just one dimensional case, but uh, you may think of it as a function of our, in, the, in the space of our one million, uh, one million dimensional space. Uh, so the, the, the function is much more complicated. But uh, what can we see here? So we have two modes, and uh, this is the global mode. While uh, the most probabilistic mass lives here. So our, if we, if we uh, try to find the global mode, we'll end up here. But if we sample from this distribution, we'll end up here. So our samples uh, will lie in this area. And this means that uh, the most typical points and the most probable points can, be, can behave in a very different way. And uh, this phenomenon is actually known from uh, in statistical mechanics and statistical physics. Uh, there are many uh, well-studied probabilistic models, such as the Ising model, uh, which exhibit exactly the uh, same behavior uh, when uh, typical points and the most probable points uh, behave in uh, different ways. And uh, this is why uh, phase transitions, so-called phase transitions, are observed there. And uh, everyone who is familiar with the Ising model uh, knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, this means that, uh, and, and uh, uh, statistical learning theory, which is our main uh, theoretical tool for analyzing generalization ability, um, is, was, was developed for analyzing the behavior of the global modes. While in practice, in deep learning, uh, we deal with the typical points, with the typical samples from distribution, which was induced by uh, the likelihood of our training data. So probably uh, the next generalization, the, uh, the next theory of generalization ability that will sooner or later be constructed uh, should rely on this on this fact that um, uh, we need to to um, study the the gap between uh, test and uh, train loss not for the for the global modes but uh, the gap which typical samples have and I'm pretty sure that uh, this theory when built uh, will be able to explain and uh, will will provide some theoretical explanation that uh, more complicated models, more, more, over, more over parameterized models generalize better uh, because uh, for, uh, for samples uh, from, from those models, uh, the gap is, is, is small between uh, training and the test error. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, I think, all I would like to say. And uh, just to conclude, so yeah, this is uh, my conclusion. Uh, currently, uh, we understand very little of what's going uh, on when uh, when we train our deep neural networks, uh, and it's uh, we we uh, we have uh, many exciting, many surprised effects observed, and uh, we still cannot uh, explain them in a, a perfect manner. Uh, also, we understand now that uh, stochastic optimization tools such as stochastic gradient and uh, its modifications have some uh, inductive bias towards good solutions, and uh, we still do not fully understand what is this uh, inductive bias, although there are some hypotheses. Uh, we also need a new uh, theoretical framework uh, to, to estimate generalization ability. Uh, and uh, probably this framework should, should, should be based uh, not on the um, uh, description of how the global modes behave, but on the description how the typical uh, samples from a uh, distribution behave. And probably uh, if this theory is constructed, uh, it will be able to prove that uh, um, larger models are somehow less complicated when trained with the stochastic optimization tools. So that's it. Uh, thanks for your attention. And uh, if you have questions, we have uh, several minutes and I'll be happy to answer. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Vedra, for a wonderful uh, lecture. Um, Actually, we have a question uh, on YouTube, so probably you're not able to see it in the in, in the chat, but I will send it to the chat. So basically, could you provide any links to works with uh, uh, Langevin for parameters? Uh, could I provide any links? Just, just a moment. Yeah, here. Uh, well, again, first of all, I, I, I can provide, of course, the links uh, that, that um, 
describe the Langevin dynamics and how it can be used for something uh, from distribution because this is uh, well-known techniques. Uh, this is a special case of uh, uh, Mo uh, Marco Chin Monte Carlo methods. So this is this is uh, what I can do. I can't provide you any any, any links to the fact that um, stochastic optimization in deep neural networks uh, well results to the, to the samples from some uh, implicit distribution because uh, this is this is uh, what is known, but uh, nobody knows. Uh, the exact form of this uh, of the distribution which is induced by uh, our training logical function so uh, at, at, at least uh, i don't know any any of the works uh, so i could provide you also works um, uh, which which uh, study the, the behavior of some uh, complicated statistical systems uh, where where the phase transitions are, are observed and where uh, we, we we see the gap between uh, most probable point and most typical point. So this is what I can do, but I I, I can't uh, well say something about the uh, what what uh, what is the exact form of the of the distribution from which we sample if we use uh, uh, stochastic gradient updates, because this is still an open question. Uh. Thank you for answering. Uh, we have yet another question. Um, has any progress been made toward the new generalization framework? And if so, could you provide any references? Uh, yes, uh, there, there is some progress. Uh, but mainly uh, it studies the, the, the behavior of uh, binary deep neural networks. So uh, surprise it appears that for binary networks, it is easier uh, to prove some some uh, bad estimates for generalization ability, and uh, there are several works, and uh, all of them are written not by uh, machine learners but by statistical physicists, because uh, statistical physics uh, this is quite known phenomena, and they try to use their expertise. And uh, in statistical physics, there are many binary models, binary statistical models, such as Ising model, and there are many many others, and so they try to uh, use their expertise uh, to now to um, explain uh, the, the generalization in binary uh, deep neural networks. So I can, I can provide you with uh, such links, uh, but uh, still to the best of my knowledge, nobody um, is using it for, for explaining the uh, behavior of uh, deep neural networks with continuous weights. Of course, there are different papers uh, which study generalization of continuous uh, deep neural networks, but they're not using, they're not based on this uh, stochastic mechanics framework uh, uh which is uh, uh i believe is the key issue and i think that uh, if we want to build good uh, generalization theory we need to to uh, to base ourselves on the fact that we're assembling rather than uh finding global modes uh thank you uh so basically we have a couple more questions on youtube I, I So yeah, I can't hear you. You have turned off your mic. Ah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, basically we have a couple of more questions uh, from YouTube. Uh, I sent first one. Uh, have you considered loss behavior with weight sterilization method? Does the training keep the double stage template? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh... I, I see in the chat. Yeah, yeah. So have you considered loss behavior with the. Weight standardization, um, do you mean weight normalization or what? Mm. I, I didn't quite understand what is weight standardization. Okay. Or is it, uh, do, do, do you mean uh, the, the, the projection of the weights on say unit sphere at each uh, step of our optimization? Uh, um, yeah, maybe uh, weight regularization. But anyway, I think the the person who asked will uh, will give additional explanations. Um, okay. Uh. Well, at least I can say that uh, if if the, if the question was about uh, what will happen if we limit ourselves to just uh, um, units uh, hypersphere, so if we allow our weights to live only on the unit hypersphere, uh, then the the answer is yes. We we uh, we we carried out the corresponding experiment and uh, we can still uh, see double distance behavior there as well. Um, okay, uh, I think um, the, the person said, 
some clarification. And uh, when we force the network's weights to be from standard normal dist, does it make any sense <laughs> for you? Uh, well, uh, but we, we, we force the weights to be from standard normal distribution at the initialization stage. But after we have initialized our weights, uh, they may change and they, they are changing and uh, it's normal is uh, increasing, increasing several orders of magnitude, by the way. Uh, so uh, then, then I, I, I still can't see uh, what is what is meant by um, forcing the network's weights to be from standard normal distribution. What we can force the network is to, uh, we can uh, force all the weights to lie on the unit hypersphere. Because we know that if we have a radio invariance, uh, then uh, the expressive ability is the same. Uh, because we can always project all our weights uh, on the unit hypersphere, and this is what we what we did, and, and this is what I already uh, told. <clears throat> yeah, we, uh, thank you. Uh, we have another question, probably the last one. It's where it's possible to follow your educational and research materials because people would like to learn more. <laughs> about your work. Uh, actually, you can send a couple of links, or I could send the links uh, of, of your research center to the chat. Maybe it will uh, be the right uh, Well, of course you can, but I think the question was about uh, more about education. If uh, I yep, uh, more about educational materials. Um, yep. So uh, about education materials, uh, we have two resources which are open sourced. So one is uh, uh, my YouTube lectures on Bayesian methods for machine learning, uh, which is in Russian on YouTube. And another one is uh, our learning materials for our Deep Bay summer school, uh, which are in English and they can be also found on YouTube. Uh, so uh, there we are, we are discussing different aspects of uh, Bayesian modeling and how Bayesian methods can be applied to uh, different probabilistic models, including deep neural networks. Uh, but of course, uh, these education materials uh, do not include uh, the, the um, material which I uh, uh, discussed today, because this is not education material. Uh, uh, this is a set of my hypotheses, and we're still working on, in, on them. Uh, and uh, probably, if you, if you want to know more about the, the, the ideas which we discussed today, you should monitor well our papers, and uh, I, I think that next year, We'll be able to publish at least one paper which will summarize uh, at least partly the material which I discussed today. 